and welcome to our Waymaking special event. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this important conversation about mental health and our communities of faith. My name is Dr. Christina Connolly, and I'm the Director of Psychological Services for the Montgomery County Public Schools. We want to welcome you to our Waymaking special on mental health in communities of faith. We know that people may have additional questions about mental health topics. Please go to our Waymaking special website for the link to the Waymaking videos that cover a variety of mental health topics, including stress and anxiety, suicide prevention, sleep management, et cetera. However, this conversation is not just about mental health. Our conversation is focused on communities of faith in mental health. And so today we will start off with a video discussing mental health in our communities of faith and the stigma of mental health in our communities um, throughout our county. Then we will have a question and answer session with a panel that is representative of our faith-based community in Montgomery County. This event is a district-wide SSL opportunity. If you are interested in earning SSL hours for this event, please stay tuned until the end of this special when we will provide a link to the SSL Advocacy Google Form. We are excited to have our Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Manifa McKnight, provide a welcome for this conversation. Good evening. My name is Dr. Monifa McKnight, Deputy Superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Waymaking Special Mental Health in Communities of Faith. Recognizing the role and importance of faith and community to our school families, Montgomery County Public Schools has forged a partnership with our faith-based community to support students' academic achievement and social-emotional wellness. This evening's screening and dialogue will be the first of many conversations that MCPS hopes to engage in with our faith-based partners and community. Like our physical health, our mental health and wellness are critical. We know that the last year has provided unexpected challenges for many of our students and their families and has impacted our mental health. Tonight, we will engage in a rich conversation with both faith-based leaders and mental health clinicians about the importance of mental wellness, when to seek outside help, and available resources in the school and community. Thank you so much for your participation. And also, we are excited to have our Associate Superintendent, Ms. Rochelle Rubin, provide a welcome for this conversation as well. Good evening. My name is Rochelle Rubin, Associate Superintendent of Student and Family Support and Engagement for Montgomery County Public Schools. It is such an honor to welcome you to the Waymaking Special Mental Health in Communities of Faith. Montgomery County Public Schools understands the significance of the faith-based community in the lives of our families. We have partnered in order to ensure that this virtual event is a success. Tonight's event will give students and their caregivers the opportunity to hear from members of the faith-based community, as well as mental health clinics on the impact of mental health in our communities. We believe tonight's conversation will be engaging, encouraging, and inspiring. Let's welcome this additional resource from our Waymaking friends, and thank you again so much for joining the conversation. So thank you, Dr. McKnight and Ms. Rubin. We appreciate your charge and support for this work. So to get our conversation going, we have put together an agenda that spans this next hour and a half. This special event is split into two parts. Um, part one, the first part is, is a video, it's a way making video on mental health and communities and faith. The video is pre-recorded and will last approximately 35 minutes. Throughout the video, you can post your questions in the Q&A box. Our colleagues will compile the questions so that the panelists can respond to the questions 
questions in the sex second section of the program. Hi, I'm Dr. Christina Connolly, and welcome again to our MCPS video series, Waymaking. Our goal is to help families make their way through many of the emotional challenges we are faced with today. I have with me today several guests who are here with us for a special conversation on mental health stigma in communities of faith. First, we have Reverend Leo Yates, who is an ordained deacon with the United Methodist Church. While he is a licensed clinician, he will provide sign language interpretation today. Then we have Erica St. Bernard, an LCMFT, who is the co-leader for Women's Ministry with Kingdom Fellowship AME. And then we have Mimi Hassani, who is the Outreach Coordinator with Islamic Society of Germantown, or ISG. Then we have Joe Wilson, who is the Senior Director of Mental Health Services and a licensed clinical social worker with the Jewish Social Services Agency, or JESA. And last but not least, we have Dr. Shauna Moore Reynolds, an LCPC, who is the Mental Health Liaison with the People's Community Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. Good to be with you. Good to be here. All right, so as we are going to get going um, with our first question, so the, pa the pandemic has placed a significant amount of stress on families around the world and concerns for mental health have increased during this time. The last year has been challenging for many. So what issues or problems are you finding in your communities? We're all waiting to go. So I'll go ahead and I'll start. <laughs> I'll acknowledge that one of the greatest challenges is, you know, acknowledging that we are in, in a crisis space, right? Just acknowledging, naming the thing what it is. I think sometimes we're trying to, we've been trying to find normal again. And so that's been a big push to find normal. But I think in finding normal, whatever that means, right, we have to acknowledge that we've lost some things. And so I think loss is a significant transition for many of us. We tend to think about grieving in concept or context of death and dying, but so many of us have lost the basic standards of living, right? The basic ways of doing things. Our students have lost milestones for education. They didn't get to start kindergarten. My little one started kindergarten virtually. And so that was really different. I didn't get to do all the first day of school things. And I think about the seniors who didn't get to have an official graduation with their friends. I think about the parents who were expecting to celebrate these milestones with their kids too. And so acknowledging those losses, but then also the loss of friendships, the loss of connection. If texting and screen time is all you have when you've been used to a combination of that with face-to-face -face interaction, that's a challenge. We talk about family dynamics. The, how many family dinners can you enjoy? I mean, a lot, but oh my goodness, how many have we had to enjoy <laughs> during the course of the pandemic, right? So I think each of those things, in addition to certainly symptoms of depression and anxiety, and again, being able to name those things for what they are, not just that I'm feeling the blues for a few days, but this blues isn't shaking. I'm more anxious about going to the store because all the precautions you have to take to get ready, we've got to wash hands and sanitize and face masks and all the stuff. And so each of those things, I think, presents great challenges for students as well as for families and certainly for church context as well. I think that's a great point. I, we, we've certainly seen a lot of um, that sense of ambiguous loss, as you, as you were talking about, and a lot of people are surprised by it in terms of we normally think about grief and loss as a, a significant process, a significant uh, event that takes place. And folks find themselves very surprised by uh, feeling the loss of the small things or the routine things that they would normally do or miss doing. I think another challenge that we see also is the weariness uh, it's very different now than it was at the beginning of the pandemic, where we were sort of working on uh, supporting individuals developing new coping skills and, hey, this is different, and planning those family dinners and, you know, hey, let's try this. And But now folks are really, there's a sense of frustration and a sense of weariness that what I've been doing isn't working anymore. And they are confronting this desire that's increasing about getting back to normal and even anxiety about what it means to get back to normal and that transition that's coming up. So I think that's a very good point about the ambiguous loss. And we just see that extended uh, in a lot of the families and folks that we're talking about when it comes to re-engaging life uh, is a real challenge too. 
Um, I certainly agree with everything had been said. Um, I am a grandma for 15 grandchildren. So I had witnessed it all. My son has to switch his family room to a library. So you walk into his family room, seeing all the desks there. The toll that it took on the parents itself is not really easy, you know, and, and, and it's been difficult for everybody to deal with that, uh, uh, especially I, one of my grandkids, uh, a child is uh, um, learning disability, and that was very, very difficult to adapt to be learning on the, on the computers and all that stuff. So it really had affect everybody, but we're looking forward to a great start again. We're looking forward to change things and we're gonna come back powerful and ready to go. So thank you. For my congregation, what I noticed um, more often is the overwhelmment. Um, parents are overwhelmed with um, everything that's going on right now, not only having to work from home and making sure their work duties are taken care of, but also we're watching over their little ones and making sure they're getting their education uh, also during this, um, this pandemic. So it's like having two jobs at one, balancing your work um, obligations, your work meetings, and also making sure your, um, your child is engaged in their schoolwork at the same time. And they're really struggling with that. Um, uh, time management, making sure all those things are done, making sure all the chores that um, usually are done are done. And a lot of times people are letting those chores go, letting the house go, not not taking care of the things that they usually take care of because they're so focused on those, the school and the work that they just don't have time or energy to get things done like they used to. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a loss in those areas also. But I think one of the biggest things with um, the COVID or coronavirus going on is the grief process has really um, um, hit people very hard. Mm -hmm. Those little things that we, those sorry, major things that we used to do in honor of our loved ones are not taking place. We're not having those memorials. We're not having the funerals. We're not having the family gatherings. Those things that we usually uh, have during the mourning process is not there anymore. And people are at a loss because of that. So th we're, we're hurting. A lot of people are hurting out here. And I'm hoping that we see a, a, the light pretty soon, very quickly. Mm -hmm. No, and all of you, I mean, thank you for your insight into this. I mean, and listening to what you are hearing from your congregations that, you know, you talked about from the beginning and like having to learn how to cope and do something new, you know, like how it felt a year ago. And then now we talk about like the weariness and all the things that are going on. You, you transitioned and then, you know, it's like it just kept going and going and going. And now we're at this place where we have to transition again and people are trying to figure out what to do. But, you know, I love Ms. Mimi's energy, you know, talking about like, we're, we're going to keep it going and like, how, what can we do? And so, you know, and that kind of gets me to my next question, you know, because as we talk about this, you know, and we see this over the course, you know, over, of over a year now, you know, with the pandemic. So, and as we're transitioning again, you know, because now, you know, as things are starting to reopen, but we're starting to see, you know, this has taken a toll on many individuals um, within different communities around um, this area. And so then, so my next question, so as a faith-based member, so what are some of the common misconceptions, you know, that you hear from members of your community um, regarding mental health and mental illness? I think one of the major misconceptions and things that further stigmatizes all things mental health is that if you believe God, if you know God's word, if you pray, if you're a good Christian or a good believer in whatever faith, that you won't struggle, that you'll be somehow above the fray and you'll be okay, you'll be able to manage. And so then we have to normalize and contextualize the fact that when you're hurting, you're hurting. And sometimes your hurts are not physical, they may be emotional. And so really normalizing the conversation around depression and anxiety, around the feelings of overwhelm, around grief and loss, so that people understand that when those things linger, they need to be paid attention to. We can't just pray it away. We can always pray, absolutely. I tell my clients, you can pray and see a therapist and take medication if it's required and do all the other elements of wellness that would be helpful. But this opportunity we had to forge the conversation for people to acknowledge that wellness is a process. It's not a one and done. Like I went to the altar or I prayed or I did this or I did that. And so it should be done, but it is very much a process. And we have to try a couple different things sometimes to find what works. And so I think that's one of the big ones that we just, I'm going to pray and that's going to be it. 
Mm, not always. Mm -hmm. Right. I also too think, you know, Jessa partners with 15 synagogues across the area um, and working with multiple congregations. Um, what we've heard is not only the presence of myths, such as if you if you require mental health treatment, there's something wrong with you, right? And there's something fundamentally uh, bad about that. There's a lot of judgment, but also we run into a lot of folks that have absolutely um, no idea or, or myth about mental health treatment, except that it, it shouldn't, it, it's not necessary or you don't need it. I mean, they, and they have no idea what to expect. And so the fear of the unknown is also what we see keeps a lot of people from engaging um, mental health services, even as we co-locate some of our staff where we used to, and now we do it via telehealth. But um, as, even as we had staff available there for consultation or discussion, uh, and, and in a way that wasn't so, um, uh, and we'll probably talk about this later on, but in a way that's not so mental health clinic-ish, right? That it's really much more about a person-to-person -person conversation and a connection. But we find there's just as much stigma in terms of, I don't know what that is. I don't want to know what that is. Uh, mental health treatment is not something that we ever think about. Uh, we don't need it, not even just a reliance on God or religion, but just it's a bad thing and we shouldn't engage it. So we find a lot of that as well that gets in the way of our ability to connect and provide access to services. Um, the concept in, of mental illness in general, people don't accept that. You know, when you have a cold, you go run to the doctor and have yourself a check. You know, when you when you cough, when you sneeze, oh, you first thing you go, you go have a physical checkup. But we don't really recognize, we don't have enough education to really uh, understand what a mental illness is all about. till it's really getting deep and then, you know, they end up by killing themselves or really doing something that it could have been prevented if they had really seeked it. We always pray for God, you know, everybody, when, whatever religion you come from, uh, you always go ask God, but it took a long time. It's been more than a year. We've been asking God, you know, so it's, it's a, uh, our congregation now are trying to get united and we're trying to do uh, educate our community about what's mental illness is it's real you know if you feel so if you feel something is different if you feel that you're not really happy and you're not the same person you were before you gotta check it out don't be afraid it's not bad to say well hey I have a depression I'm gonna take some medicine and I'll be okay you know and instead of waiting till the last minute and you really cannot uh, uh, win uh, the disease and then uh, the result is really uh, bad. So we need to do more education about mental illness and, uh, and, and understand what is not something that it's, it's bad to be depressed for a couple days or something is not doing well. We are all human beings. We can only take so much. We can, now we're overwhelmed. We're taking more than we can handle. And God tell us, don't take more than what you can handle. So pray, but also seek the medical advice. That's my advice. Thanks. I agree with Mimi. Education is the key. And there's still the stigma out there that we have to choose either or. We can't have both. But God created the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the social workers, the counselors. We're, we're, we're people of God also. So you can find a, a mental health counselor that has that background if that's what you prefer. And one thing I also like to stress with um, the clients that I work with that um, we hear about faith, uh, faith and works. You know, we can have our faith, but the counseling is the work. We're working in, on, on improving our mental health. We're working at getting at a better place. We're working at understanding why we have the feelings we have or why we have the behaviors we have. This is the work. And it is work that goes along with it to, to get to a better place. So you can have all those in one package. You don't have to choose one or the other. Um, but in the end, um, we all could get to a better place. You don't have to live in that sadness or that depression or that or ha with that with that anxiety. You learn how to um, to control it, or how to end it, or how to work with it. Um, there's there's skills out there. There's there there are workers out there that will help you get to that place, that good place. So you don't have to stay in that place, that that place of darkness um, forever. No, and I mean you all resonated on the fact that you know you can 
have religion and mental health. It doesn't have to be either or. You can pray and go to therapy. Um, and, you know, and I, I was always taught, you know, God gives you free will, you know, and that the free will is there to help you like to say, hey, I need to go and seek help. So you can pray on it and you can pray for the strength that you need in order to go seek out this provider, go get help. You can still go to your path or go see your faith-based leaders and, or, and talk to them about some of your concerns. But, you know, and even with talking talking with religious leaders, you know, here and around the country that, you know, there are some things that they just don't have the expertise in. And so like, it's kind of like, are you going to go, if, like I'm diabetic. So am I going to go to my pastor and say, you know, I need you to help me with my diabetes or am I going to go to my endocrinologist? I'm going to go to my endocrinologist. Um, so, but there are some things, you know, like I need strength. I need some, you know, guidance, some help, you know, and I can go to, you know, the pastor and say, Hey, I need this, but you, it doesn't mean that it eliminates that you don't have the need for the other piece. And so, and when we think about, you know, and, you know, going into, and you also talked about, you know, because for folks, there is a difference between mental health and mental illness. And like we all talked about the preventative things that we need to do in order to stay mentally healthy, like in order for us to stay physically healthy, you got to eat right, you got to exercise, there are things you can do in order to be mentally healthy as well. Um, and so versus and if you can work on those things to try to also then to prevent potentially mental illness. And so but if you have to look at both and if you have a mental illness, then what are the things that you can do in order to get the additional, more intensive support that you need um, to help you with that? And so, you know, I, I just so appreciated, you know, the comments that you all have made and looking at this because, you know, it, it, it is a big concern and that um, just with talking with um, faith-based leaders, the, you know, the things that are needed in order to help congregations, you know, in terms of helping the adults, but then also helping, you know, our students that are in the tenure congregations. And so, you know, how can, and with this, you know, how are we all working together with that? And so and that, that ties into my next point, you know, and thinking about, so then what do you think that we could say to help overcome mental health stigma and help our communities, you know, start to really have honest conversations around this topic? I think one of the great ways to get started is to begin the conversations. I think when faith leaders make mention of counseling, when faith leaders make mention of overwhelm and stress, and again, name the things that people are experiencing so that in the same way, I'm sure some of us have been to whatever our faith center is and the minister is you know, sharing the word and we're like, how did they know? Like, it feels like it's very personal, like they knew the details about your life. In the same way, when a minister mentions mental health, mentions struggle, mentions frustration and overwhelm, you would feel seen in that moment. And that would be a way of, again, allowing each other to acknowledge that, yeah, I am feeling a way. I am needing to pay more attention to this. So I think, again, when we can make things so much more a part of common conversation and not make it be that we have to have a mental health service, maybe necessarily, but maybe even a mental health moment. I've done a few of those for a couple of neighboring churches in our community where on Sunday for a season, they had about a five minute window where they would have different mental health professionals come in and share on a general topic. And it was a part of the, part of the service right after praise and worship but just a part of the service and a way to normalize the conversations to let people know that there were therapists and other clinicians who could be supportive. And so I think that's always a great way when we can normalize it. I've even heard pastors or ministers share that they're in therapy and that you know, blows people away. Like what you are, in, and it's, it, it normalizes it again. It makes you human. It reminds us that even the people in leadership, the people in place positions of power, have benefited from therapy. I remember when I was reading Michelle Obama's book, and she mentioned that she and Barack Obama went to couples counseling. I know that was revolutionary for some couples. The notion that the president of the United States went to therapy. Yes, absolutely. So again, when we can make it um, palatable, make it commonplace, make it common day you know, conversation, it really does release some people from the stigma that holds them back and keeps them from pursuing the, the unknown, because it is that for sure, but we just normalize it and make it accessible in that way. I think those are great points. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, those are great points. Uh, and, you know, that's what, uh, in terms of our partnerships with our synagogue congregations involves, is we say engagement's a conversation or several conversations. And it's more than just one time offering a pamphlet or putting our notice in the vestibule there or, or a, an announcement in the bulletin. Uh, it really is an ongoing conversation to normalize the approach of understanding how to maintain mental wellness as well as physical wellness. 
Uh, and so I, for us, I think that's been important to step. And the other thing is to partnering with the leaders of the congregations. Um, and we do have uh, supports for those leaders who often find themselves overwhelmed by the number of people that are looking for uh, support and mental, really mental health treatment, as you were mentioning before, you know, they don't feel equipped to deal with some of the challenges that people are bringing to them. So working in partnership with them, supporting them, supporting their congregation is also a great way for us to um, normalize accessing mental health uh, professionals and really putting us into that everyday space where they they're comfortable so leveraging a relationship that already exists so people who can go to their congregation their synagogue and trust those people that are there they have a relationship for us to come in and join in that relationship and and meet them where they are is also been uh, incredibly successful in getting folks to feel more comfortable engaging with us um I totally agree with everything had been said before. Uh, so in our congregations, uh, uh, we have a women's group and uh, women's are the backbone of the house. You know, I always say, if I can run my household, I can run the whole country, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, they, it's easier to talk around you because they are in contact with their children and you know everybody. So uh, they discuss, they talk openly, free. You know, so after we have the halakha and stuff like that, they talk about what they've been facing and what they could do. Uh, so I can't emphasize enough about education, education, education. Uh, because once you recognize that there is mental illness, it's not just a cold or you're just upset today, it's really continuing. You can have a treatment and you'll be good and you'll be able to live your life happy and like everybody else. So uh, in our congregation, we focus the women's group are the, you know, the mover and the shaker and, and, and the one that they will say, go tell the imam, go tell the imam, don't tell, you know, go be open, be open. So, you know, so that's how we deal with it. And uh, it's been working. It's been working greatly. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, we will continue to do the good job like that. So thanks. Yeah. Yes, I also agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I actually believe change begins at the top. And if we start with the leaders of the church and getting them the education to know what is um, mental, mental illness or what is mental issues that, um, that may be going on in their church. So it could be a, a, like a small course, like a psychological first aid or something to where they can get that information to know that this um, um, a person of my congregation may be going through a crisis, may need additional assistance, may need more than prayer. So I, I think if we uh, start with educating our leaders on, on what is mental illness, when is it time to refer out, when is it time to get additional assistance, that will trickle down um, into the congregation um, in the end. No, and thank you all for that. And, you know, and, and of course, you know, as a school psychologist, I always got to sit there and throw in there, you know, as we all are, are talking about, you know, the needs that we have for our families, you know, um, in our congregations and, you know, also thinking about, especially because many of your congregations probably also have like youth ministries and what are we doing to help, you know, our students to understand, you know, what are some of the things that they are seeing, you know, and especially adolescents who may not, you know, they, this, you know, they're not always as forthcoming to the adults as, you know, I, I have a burgeoning teenager. And so, you know, like, you know, we have a good relationship. Um, but, you know, I'm the also, she also knows, like, I'm the psychologist, and I'm always the person that's coming to talk to her. What's your, how, how are you feeling today? You know, she probably look at me and roll her eyes. Um, but, you know, and as we were thinking about this, you know, and if you, many of you, you know, you all are mental health professionals, you know, within your congregations, and as such a great resource um, for your congregations to go, and have some of these conversations. So as you, if you are a faith-based leader, you're listening to this or a member of your congregation, and you're hearing this, you know, and you're thinking, you know, hey, maybe I can go and find a mental health professional in my congregation who'd be willing to have these conversations. Or, you know, or maybe there's some folks, you know, within your local schools who may can come help, maybe talk to some of your youth groups, you know, so forth. Those who have understanding of working with mental illness and how it impacts the mental health and how it impacts those at different developmental 
levels, like, you know, starting, you know, from preschool all the way up to them being teenagers. And so, you know, and as we incorporate and start thinking about those things, um, and as we continue to move forward, you know, through this, and, you know, because we're all at different plots, you know, I, I sat there, it's going to be so interesting, like, I was looking, I was on social media, and I saw this meme, you know, talking about, you know, right, right now, you know, we're all in the same storm, but we may be on different, you know, boats, some got a yacht, some got a dinghy, some got a life preserver, and, you know, everybody's at a different point, and so, but what can we do to meet you where you are, and so, and how are we all working together in order to meet the needs, you know, within our schools, within our congregations, and so forth, because there's so many individuals who are in need, and that, and I, and I love the idea of thinking about from this kind of preventative stance um, in terms of how can we like having I think it was um, Erica who talked about you know having the, the different things throughout the you know the congregation having something after praise and worship and they have like five minutes to talk about it. like I love that because that really starts to incorporate these conversations just like you would have you know like a conversation about heart health doing you know um, whatever whichever month that is or maybe having conversations around breast cancer screenings in October you know like May is mental health awareness month around the country and maybe folks don't know that that might be a natural way of trying to incorporate some of these things into the top that you have um, in your congregations each year. So I, I, I love that. So, all right. And so my, my last question is one that we always ask in Waymaking um, in terms of looking at, so, so do each of you have any suggestions or feedback for families and students, you know, to help them during this time? And if you have any, you know, insight that you want to share or maybe something that you do that helps you, you know, in order to manage stress um, that's going on, we're always here to try to help our families to become more resilient. I was trying to let somebody else go first. <laughs> so I was going to say, I think one of the greatest things that we can do, again, is just have common conversations. I know parents are talking to their kids quite a bit about school and about grades, but I think about pushing some of that academic stuff to the side and really just asking your kid, how are you? Really just looking them in the eye and, and paying attention, right? Because we're busy. We're, as you know, as Dr. Shauna mentioned earlier, parents are trying to do the work they need to do at home and make sure students are logged in for the right class at the right time. Where's the Zoom link? What Google Meet are you supposed to be in? I have a meeting. I'm trying to do this and the other. So really just those moments where we can literally look at our children. I think sometimes I have to catch myself. I have a six-year-old. And so I have to be intentional to like look eye to eye with her and really just be present in that moment and, and be there. I think so much of this season has caused us to be distracted by all the things that are going on. And sometimes we miss little things. And so those moments of checking in, those moments of time at dinner where we're not just asking, how was your school day? But how are you? How are you feeling? What are your friends talking about? And trying to just connect with them in that way. Another thing that I'm really, really a big fan of that my family and I do periodically is we do outdoor walks. We go for walks together, sometimes just my daughter and I, sometimes the three of us, my daughter, my husband and I, and we are taking nature walks. We're taking a look at the plants that are growing. We're looking at the sky and seeing how blue it is today, or, oh, there's some pink or red in the sky today, or look at this bloom that's blossoming, or look at this grass. So it looks like they cut the grass, right? So we're just paying attention to some of those things that I think, again, slow us down and help us to be present. So much of this season has us distracted by a hundred different things at one time. And so sometimes when we can just pull ourselves and pull our attention to the present moment, that can be a really helpful way to attune ourselves as we focus on our breath and think about how we're breathing clean air and how even with a mask on, right? Because we still walk with our masks to be safe. But realistically, just really slowing ourselves down because this season is very hurried. And so if we as parents can model that for our students, I model, I try to model regularly some deep breathing with my kid and they'll follow you. You take an inhale and they'll follow you and their breath will match yours to some extent. And so these moments of just slowing down as much as we're hurried and ready to get back to normal, there are some things about this slow down time that I think we can take with us that will be beneficial to our mental and emotional wellness as much as we are working to preserve it. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I think one of the things we've worked with families to do and, and congregations is to support how um, families can reinvent traditions, particularly religious traditions, and how they can reimagine celebrating holidays. Uh, we just had Passover for the Jewish uh, calendar, uh, along with Easter for the for others, um, and how to reimagine being able to celebrate as a family, uh, having your Seder, being able to include people, how you do that virtually in a meaningful way, or even in some cases, this was probably midway through the pandemic, how to effectively manage sort of bubbling with other families and how could you, um, you know, where to find testing, how to make sure you're doing all the practices. Of course, it's a little easier now with everyone having or, or vaccinations increasing. Um, and so it's a little easier, but being able to help people find connection um, is has been really important. Um, and so uh, for people that have missed that connection with the grandparents or with neighbors, or friends, how could we create community differently? And so we've worked with families and, and congregations in terms of coaching folks, how to do that, how to do it safely, uh, and how to reimagine um, those traditions that have been really important to you and sort of keeping yourself grounded, right, in this not normal time. Uh, and that's been really helpful as well. Uh, this is great. I'm so happy to be a part of this group. Yes, <laughs> uh, we all we do the same thing. Uh, uh, we connect with our members and uh, in Islam, uh, we are in the month of Ramadan right now. So uh, most of the families are fasting and this is a time that they really reflect in themselves and a quiet time. So uh, what we do with our families and we try to encourage them is that have a special time. Make some time to sit down, no phones, you know, no TV, nothing, you know. And this is one hour of the day that it's for you and your family to sit down and talk with them and see what they're doing and, you know, what there's, you know, what's going on in their mind. Because each one of us are from, you know, I'm, we're for all from different cultures and different religions, you know. So we try to work together and treat each other as a human being with respect and learn from the other. What works for you may work for me. Even if you're Christians and I'm Muslim or you're Jewish and I'm Muslim, there is a commonality among us. We have to remember we're created by one God from one clay. That clay didn't have a color. So we have to connect with each other on the level of human being and respect one another. Embrace diversity, not divisiveness. So that's what we call, and that's what we try to educate our family and our children and work with them. So yeah. I have to say, I'll just say, I think it would do us all good if we voted Mimi grandmother of the world. I, I think <laughs> with this kind of energy, I feel like she, that'll help all of us in the pandemic, right? I call my 15 grandchildren my pilot program because <laughs> I have a child care business. So I tell my families, I whatever works in my grandkids, it's going to work for your children. So absolutely. <laughs> so what I, I encourage our uh, families and couples to do is to um, do what brings you joy. I know we're under a lot of stress on a daily basis, but what brings you joy? What makes you happy? What makes you smile? For my family, it's water. We're water babies. So if we have time, we'll do a daytime trip to the beach and back and drive to and from and just spend some time close to that water, close to that beach, the sand. Or if we can't get there, we'll find a pond, a lake, a fountain, you know, go on a trail. Um, um, if, I, if I'm very stressed, I will pull up YouTube and play Sounds of the Beach just to relax or just to take my mind off the stressors of the day. So find out what brings you joy, what releases stress for you and use it on a regular basis. But I think one of the biggest things we can do for each other right now is to give each other grace and understanding that when we may not get everything done in a timely manner, the clothes may not get washed as much as they should, or the lawn may not be mowed, or the weeds, weeds may not be pulled. But, you know, we're, we're under a pandemic and we're under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. So I, I truly believe that we should be giving each other a lot of grace, especially within our families. Um, give each other uh, grace with, with everything that's going on. So I think if we do that, it'll make a, a little bit better during this hard time. 
Oh my goodness, Dr. Shana, when you talked about the water, you spoke to my heart because I just love the water and being near the water. And I was, on Sunday, I was at a park and we like walked around the lake. So I was just like, just like I'm yeah. putting myself in my own place. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and thank you all for all of your suggestions. You know, I really do hope that, you know, for those of our viewers that are watching this, you know, you can hear something, you know, from any of our panelists, you know, and really, you know, get some ideas about, you know, what are some of the things that you can and do at home. So as we close our video, you know, I want to thank our panel for your time to be with us today and Reverend Leo for interpreting for us. And we want to thank our viewers for joining us for Waymaking. All right, so thank you all for watching our Waymaking video. So now we are up to part two of our um, live session where we're going to have a Q&A um, part where we're going to have panelists um, come and speak to us and answer your questions from the community. So to get us started, I would like to introduce our wonderful panelists. And so first, you saw her in the video. Um, we have Ms. Mimi Hassanin, who is the member of the Islamic Society of Germantown. Uh, Mimi is a grandmother of 15 and is the outreach coordinator for the ISG. And then next we have Lori Cole, who is the is an LCSWC and a senior director of outpatient mental health services with the Jewish Social Services Agency or JASA. So welcome, Lori. And next we have um, Dr. Cynthia Termgran, who is a psychiatrist and a member of Mount Calvary Baptist Church. Um, Cynthia is the chairperson of their counseling ministry. And then last we have Reverend Sonia Williams, who operates a clinical marriage and family therapy practice, which has provided mental health services for over 20 years. She also runs a nonprofit organization called Love Savers International. Um, she is a member of Kingdom Fellowship. Welcome, Sonia. So. And next, I wanna make sure people know of my um, co-host, uh, Ms. Nicole Elaine. Got to get that unmute. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Elaine. I'm an executive director in the deputy superintendent's office. But more importantly, I am one of the coordinators of our faith-based initiative and our advisory group where we connect with our faith-based community in order to touch the lives of students. And so I will be helping Dr. Connolly in moderating today's questions. Um, please continue to add them to the chat. And so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Connolly, with the first question. All right, so in getting to some of the questions that are in the Q&A, so um, first up, someone asked, so um, how can people cope with anxiety and stress for a middle schooler? Um, do you have any specific strategies to help in relieving stress? I could start. Is this, is this open to the panel? Yes, anyone in the panel can answer. Oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. I um, have several middle school grandchildren and their parents often call on me to help them. And so some of the things I recommend and actually do with them are um, to make sure they have outlets for physical activity. Sitting in front of a computer for their education, for hours at a time with brief breaks um, is just not good for them. And that can create anxiety. So having opportunities for vigorous physical activity is good. In addition, I have taught my grandchildren some meditation techniques and they actually like those. I, I've been surprised, but uh, meditation can be very helpful in down-regulating the tension and uh, stress that can accumulate in your body that uh, can cause anxiety. So those are two of the things that I can um, think of. And I, and I guess the other thing is really the adults around them, first of all, need to take care of themselves so they can be present with their young people and really be present so that you can listen. 
I think sometimes out of our own frustration, we spend a lot of energy talking to and at the children. If we could just pull back, take a deep breath, and sometimes we have to wait for them to be open to talking. But I think it's important for us to be present so we can create those opportunities for them to open up and tell us what's on their heart. So those are the things that I would suggest. I was going to say the exact same thing, which was the first thing you said. Turn off the TV and go out and play. Play. And I think that's a lot of... Um, really good advice from therapists and parents just to, 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 get, to get them out in the sunshine, get them out in the grass, get them out in the dirt and play. Um, and the other thing I, I, you know, somebody mentioned earlier about the, um, uh, the things that are needed for physical health are the exact same things that are needed for mental health. So you want to look at nutrition, you want to look at sleep, you want to look at, um, you know, mindfulness practices, you want to look at Everything you you look at for physical health impacts mental health. So I, I would just add add all of that. And I uh, co-sign on both of the uh, comments from the previous panelists. I um, we started COVID. My son was in middle school. He started the ninth grade in in the fall. So. We've kind of had a little bit of middle school and now we're doing high school and COVID. And um, one of the things that has been consistently helpful is taking advantage of the opportunity to enter into his world. You know, this was a silver lining for us, um, having my husband at home and I'm at home and de definitely there have been challenges, but we have rediscovered ping pong and I have actually, you know, discovered that video games aren't really that bad. <laughs> and so he's been able to share some things with, with me that I may not have um, had the time to see. And so um, certainly listening, but being available to enter into the kids' world, to learn some things, being open to learning from them, not just about the way, um, the things that they enjoy, but even about the way that they see the world. And uh, kids, when we listen to them, it buys us, what well, I call them talking points. It, it allows me to get some extra time to say some things as well to them, to impart um, some wisdom. Also, this is an opportunity to, um, as a family, learn something new, uh, learn how to cook a new meal, take a class online together. Um, we discovered um, that you can get on Eventbrite and there are free Tai Chi classes. So there's something that you guys can embrace that's new for all of you and you can learn together. You can also focus on creating, being intentional about creating memories. Like what are some of the memories that you want, you know, you dreamt of having before you had kids? What are those things that you could do um, at home, like, like cooking or baking or painting a room? It's an opportunity to, even a middle schooler can learn to paint. A middle schooler can learn how to uh, garden. You know, there are skills that they can uh, learn that will increase their self-esteem. So I, I think that, you know, this last couple of years has created challenges, but it's also created some really rich opportunities to connect with our kids in ways that we may not have done before. So. Um, I want to add to this. Uh, I always say food and art are universal language. So I get my grandkids, especially my granddaughters, and we cook. We make up meals, we put spices, we just, may, you know, I mean, just enjoy having fun. You know, sometimes it burns, sometimes it is really good, but just having the experience and talking about the food and what it is. And they bring their friends, you know, always learn about something different. All also, I have one of my granddaughters, she is an artist, you know, she loved to draw. So drawing your feeling, making your feeling come out through the drawing and try to interpret it, that picture. So in a summary, I said food and art or universal language. Try to connect with your children on that basic level. Thank you. I just also want to reiterate 
um, I think Erica may have said it earlier, just normalizing, you know, stress, uh, normalizing frustration. Sometimes as parents, we try to shelter our kids from seeing the stress that we feel. And I do understand the value and benefit of that, but it's also good for them to know that they're not the only ones in the house who are experiencing stress, that this is a normal part of what we're going through. And, you know, you can create moments where everybody talks about how they're feeling and um, including the parents. The parents say, yeah, this was kind of stressful being cooped up in the house for, uh, you know, the second week or the third week or whatever it is that's causing uh, stress. And but as a part of that conversation, you also talk about the coping skills that you're going to use to get through it. I was thinking this way, but I've decided um, I found a text that I'm going to focus on this uh, this week in the Bible. Hey, let's look at this uh, text that talks about strength or encouragement or um, that allows us to draw some wisdom uh, from our faith. And let's talk about how we can apply that in our lives. So I just wanted to add that piece to it. I, I would just make one final um, comment that if you're doing all of these wonderful things and you're still seeing symptoms like withdrawal or not eating or um, something you find on their social media that is disturbing, that's the time to really seek out help. And that's what we're all here for. So, you know, you try all of those other, other things first, but at some point there might be a time to, to seek out some extra help. So, yeah. Thank you Thank all you. for your comments. Go ahead, Nicole. No, no, no. So, I mean, I love it. And, and as a mother of a working mom of a seven-year-old, I'm taking notes because, you know, I think that the point that you made about finding the joy and, and normalizing the stress, and, and I, I have found that I have been guilty of trying to shield the kids from the pandemic. It, we've experienced it. So um, here's the next question that we do have from um, an audience member. How can community members who are struggling with a need ask for help from their faith leaders? What are your suggestions? How can community leaders who are struggling ask for help from? A community member, a community member ask, you know, approach or ask their, their faith leaders for help. What are your suggestions? Or is there some um, question in there about a difficulty that somebody is having? Like what, other than just being direct, what, what is the actual so I, I, I'm i getting the sense that the person is struggling and, and trying to find the best way to approach or to reach out to their faith-based community to, to receive help, to say that they're struggling. So every um, worship, place of worship um, may have different protocols. Uh, so I can only speak to mine. Um, and I know that we have uh, when we were meeting in person, we and, and it looks like we're headed back that way. We usually have ministers who stay um, after service and avail themselves um, at the uh, in the sanctuary so that people can come up and talk. We also have a prayer request box where people can complete um, a, a card that says, "I'm having this." type of situation um, and I may need some help. I'd like to talk to one of the ministers. Um, we also, um, in using technology, especially over uh, this last year or so, um, there's a Kingdom Cares uh, line where people can get in touch with the church. I think they text 313131 and they're able to uh, get in touch with um, the part of the ministry that serves the community. Um, so we've tried to make several routes available, um, but I think it's also um, beholden upon the ministers to sort of keep an eye out, be aware of symptoms um, and to, to try to notice, to be alert to people in the uh, community who might, or in the congregation who might be showing signs of of uh, difficulty and stresses where tearfulness, uh, just really sullen changes in mood. Um, I think that's also helpful. Uh, 
Right. So um, I know one of the questions that came up in it, um, it ties in with, and you all talked about this briefly, um, was so what other physical activities other than yoga um, can help cope with your mental health for, it has on here for a male who is in 11th grade, but it could be for anybody. So many, so many. I mean, music is one. Um, I know a lot of, I do this too. I, you know, if I have a break, even a 15 minute break, I put on a song and I dance for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, walk for 15 minutes, sit out in the sun for 15 minutes. You know, there's just so many things that can just be little punctuation marks during your day to, to, to make you feel better. Um, Yoga's great. Uh, not, it's not for everybody. Uh, walking is perfect. Getting out in nature is perfect. Uh, uh, for me, uh, I am originally from Egypt. So we love to belly dance. We love dancing. So when I put the music on, you watch out, okay? <laughs> it's just, I let it go. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know what they call it, but uh, music is a great therapy for you. Uh, uh, and also uh, uh, art, you know, try to express your feeling through art. It's a, it's a great way because it's you and the paper and you're drawing your thought and your feeling. And, and, and then you look at it and then you said, oh, did I do that? I mean, sometimes it's great. And so it's, oh no, was I feeling sad? Art can tell you how you're feeling. So dancing, listening to the music and art. That's my, my um, prescription. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, it's right. <laughs> I want to chime in. Um, I uh, have a 15 year old boy, and he is not going to belly dance, even if I try to <laughs> get him involved. He, he's not interested in yoga either. He's not really interested in Tai Chi. He would do martial arts. Um, and so we have had to find things online that um, he might do. And fortunately, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, you know, he is a gamer. And I was initially just concerned about all the video game time, all the screen time. But I learned that video games actually increase dopamine. Um, 30 minutes of video game time releases about the same amount of dopamine as a 20 minute uh, workout. And so I felt a little bit, I felt a little bit better about it because it is something that has allowed him to connect with his friends. And even though he's stationary, the way he plays is very vigorous. <laughs> and so um, it does lift his mood. So, you know, initially I was really opposed to it, but after talking to the uh, doctor, uh, he sort of explained the appeal of it. And then there are also, um, there are these apps where they're like a synthesizer that allows kids to make beats. And so that again is back to music and he loves that. He, he really enjoys it. So those are my two recommendations. Also increases dopamine. So, yeah. You know, one of the things <clears throat> that I would add to this too, I, I agree that all of the creative uh, ideas that you have are, are great, but as we are opening up with more people being vaccinated, uh, I think that um, being able to be together with friends and other family members in ways that are safe, uh, exercising even, taking walks or runs with friends, uh, playing basketball, you know, all of those things are okay uh, now that uh, we are opening up with the proper precautions. Um, I, I think physical activity, if that was the original question, those are a couple of ideas that could, um, you know, relate to those questions too. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Mimi, I feel like you're going to be teaching us belly dancing and some <laughs> art, and you're going to be everybody's grandmom. <laughs> but seriously speaking, um, for our young people, a question came up. How, what are your suggestions of the simplest way for them to talk to their parents about mental health? Uh, um, I, I think it's just that you need to give some time and, 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 uh, and be open mind and, and let your children feel comfortable talking to you. Uh, I, I'm always open with my grandkids, you know, I will go down to their level, you know, it's not like I am the grandma and you got to respect me and all that stuff. No, I'll play a game with them and then I'll challenge them and then I'll, I'll start a conversation and then they open up to you. Uh, a lot of the time, we don't have the time. A lot of, you know, the problem is a lot of people don't have the time to sit with their children. Uh, and, and that causes uh, uh, isolation or, or uh, you know, the disengagement uh, between the children and the parents. Uh, so making time, making a special time between you and your and your children and your husband and sit together and talk about something have fun have fun life is fun but we are all taking it so seriously and stressed about about everything sometimes we need to let it go sometimes we have to believe that there is a higher power above me that's going to take care of me and i pray that god will help me to reach a safe point and help my community and my family. That's always was my approach. Uh, I don't know if it worked for everybody, but I'm always like I'm I'm always uh, open. Uh, uh, I always invite people. I love conversation, socializing with your neighbor. Get to know your neighbor. Get to know your community. Uh, you don't have to have agenda. You know, just say hello. You know, uh, open your door. So that's just my way of how I've been here for the last 50 years and how that's how um, I lived my life. Mm -hmm. Building bridges so you can connect bridges and cross those bridges. I, I so agree as a therapist and as um, a supervisor of therapists, what we do with little kids is play. That's, that's the kind of therapy we do is play. You can get a lot of conversation over a sand tray or over, you know, a puppet show or over a little, you know, Candyland game or whatever it is, you can get a lot of conversation over play. Um, they, they, they are not able to articulate the way older kids are. And so um, they do through play and they do through art. You know, I really like the idea of modeling. Um, I think the question was about how we get our kids to um, or how we create safe spaces for our kids to talk to us about how you're feeling. And I think that um, one of the great uh, things that's happened for us is we have um, a regular family meeting. And, you know, each person gets to share what they want, what, what's going on, what they don't like. And my husband and I get to model how to share a complaint the proper way. We get to model um, how to talk about our feelings and emotions. Uh, we, we sometimes pick a topic, like maybe we're gonna talk about money. And my son who's 15 is a part of that conversation. We're you know, sharing, modeling discussions about money. Um, and so what, what I'm hoping what happened is that discussion about emotions is just as normal as discussion about finances and discussion about managing time and managing resources that um, having positive emotions and negative emotions just becomes a normal part of life and talking about them is a normal part of life. So.
thank you all. Um, and so we really do appreciate, you know, all the comments. And I want to continue to promote for our attendees um, for tonight's event. So please continue putting your Q&A, your questions into the Q&A box um, so that we can go through and continue to answer them um, as we're going through this evening. All right. So my next question for the group is, so what are some ways to help people who go through mental health breakdowns? And what are some ways to help yourself when you feel anxious? Well, can you, or the, the um, participant, um, explain what breakdown means? They 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 did not share that but mm -hmm. you know i'm guessing and you know for and especially some of our students when they talk about like when they get to the place of feeling like extreme frustration maybe um they are having emotional outbursts in class uh, maybe they're having tantrums maybe um you know they're getting angry and maybe get into a fight with somebody and they're just like at an emotionally exhausted place some people may even be having a panic attack so i'm thinking like you know someone who's in a really extreme emotional experience okay. Okay. Um, and is just trying to figure out what to do and how to manage that. I would say try to take time out. Mm -hmm. Try to take time out just for yourself and, 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 and feel your heart and your mind. Uh, some, uh, you know, meditation is a great way, just being by yourself and focusing uh, it's not praying because sometimes we always say pray, pray, pray. And sometimes people say, I am tired. You're always saying pray, pray, pray. I pray, I pray, but nothing has happened. Sometimes you need to connect with your inner soul. You know, sometimes you need that connection. Sometimes you need time quiet. Sometimes you need to revisit yourself and what you've been doing. Uh, 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 don't, don't always have an agenda that you have to get this done. Have some time out. Enjoy life. We are here for a short time. So we must have a side to ourselves to take care of yourself. Because you are, remember I said, if I run my household, I can run the whole country. I have so much responsibility taking care of my family. But it comes natural. God created us with that ability to do it. So sometimes you need to take time out, time out. Sometimes you said, wait a minute, I have to pamper myself. I have to go out and enjoy anything that I like and come back, you'll be happy. I do this all the time. I go for a walk. I do something that it's just me and my soul and my creator. So it works, for me it works. So I hope I, can help. I just want to clarify, is this for the, the, par the parent? What should the parent do if the child is having a breakdown or what should no, the child do? I think this is something to add for a student who is asking. We have many students who are on here getting their SSL hours watching. Um, and so we, we will have that information at the end for those students who are wondering when that slide will pop up. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think this is our students who are asking. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, but I mean, we have adults and students, so you can answer for both. So okay. don't worry. We have family members, all members of the family who are watching tonight. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. I, I, I would just add to Mimi that f not just find, f find a person to talk to, whether it's your teacher, if that doesn't work, your guidance counselor, if that doesn't work, another teacher, if that doesn't work, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a friend, a neighbor, whoever you can find that, that feels comfortable and safe um, and create, you know, a, just a, I call it a brave space, not a safe space, but a brave space where you can um, stick your toe in the water and, and uh, find an adult who you can talk to, who can, who can help you find next steps, whether that's therapy or talking to your parents or, you know, whatever the next step is, um, find a brave place. Lori, your, your response actually ties to another question that we have from a student in the, the Q&A. Um, the student says, sometimes I feel afraid to discuss with my parents when I get so stressed. What do I do at that time? 
is there somebody else that 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 you know young person can talk to is there a sibling is there an aunt or uncle is there a guidance counselor is there somebody that can bridge the gap between that young person and their parents you know to 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 keep trying to talk to somebody and don't keep it in um keeping it keeping it in is just um gonna gonna create worse anxiety and worse problems so if you can't talk to your parents, find somebody that can help you talk to your parents or find somebody else you can talk to. Um, you know, if you're actually as of July 1st, um, you're 12 and over, you can find a therapist. Mm. Yes. You know, I would I would also add that sometimes we underestimate our parents. They may be more receptive than you think. And, and it might be worthwhile to just kind of introduce things in a small way to see how receptive they might be. Sometimes they'll surprise you. So I wouldn't give up on them entirely. Now, you also may be a person who's had an experience where it, it was a disaster. I wouldn't approach it, approach them in that case. But if you haven't at all, I would say give them a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I also want to throw in there just real quick, you know, especially for our students who are watching this. So if you're at a place where you're fearful, you know, of these conversations and maybe you don't know how to approach it or how to ask the question, you know, you do have mental health staff who work with you in your schools. And so, you know, while we have individuals here, you know, they all work out in the community and they're doing awesome jobs and providing support at multiple levels in different places. Um, but you're also your school counselors, each of your schools have have a school psychologist. Um, and if you're like kind of tentative about having that conversation, they can help you to schedule the time to talk with your parents around that conversation if you have that desire. If you're like, well, I don't know what they're going to say. Um, because then we do want to, you know, because we want all of our students, you know, as um, Lori and Cynthia have shared, to have that trusted adult, you know. So, and hopefully, you know, it's your family member. And if, if it's not, then hopefully it's somebody in your school, because we do want all students to have a trusted adult. But we also want to understand understand that and if you're a friend so let's say if your friend is having trouble and you don't know how to approach it either so we teach our students with our signs of suicide prevention program how to acknowledge their friends feelings how to care for them and how to tell a trusted adult and so if you're looking at this like well maybe I'm having struggles with myself or maybe my friend is having struggles and I need to talk to somebody about it you know we encourage you to go to your family members and have those conversations but if you can't there are individuals at the school that can help you as well and I just want to just sort of put it out there to the parents that, you know, sometimes young people don't feel comfortable for a variety of reasons. We are the, the parents are the authority figures. They're the ones who give consequences and punishments and, you know, teens especially seem to look at us as being very judgmental and uh, wanting to avoid loss of privileges and freedom and so forth. So I can understand it. So I, I think that it may be good for parents uh, to think proactively and to be intentional about fostering uh, relationships between their kids and other people. I know we, um, my husband and I have uh, been very intentional about making sure that my son can talk to his uncle and that they have time together, uh, that he also has a couple of coaches that he can go to and ministers at church that he can go to. And he has those numbers and he can contact them if uh, he feels like he can't talk to, some, to us about something. And because we've been intentional about it, we know that the people that he um, make contact will likely try to mediate a discussion between him and us so that they are uh, closing the loop and bringing him back to us as well. So. Thank you all. And so my next question on here is so um, I have both of my parents are atheists and I am willing to believe in God, but I am not sure how to tell them. Um, do you all have any information on, you know, just kind of maybe how from a um, 
from your own faith perspective, maybe how to start having some of those. And that can be like any kind of difficult conversation with your family. How can you start having those kind of difficult conversations that may come about? I would just uh, start by, by dipping a toe in the water and starting off a conversation by saying, you know, are you open to hearing some things that I'm struggling with? And typically parents will say, yes, I'm open. And then you, you, you have a little bit of a, a toe in the water to start a conversation. But, um, you know, you, you sort of launch into something like that by, by, by asking if it's okay to launch into something like that first. Um, so what I would start with. I'd agree. I think that's a great place to start. And I think also that um, adding curiosity to conversations, you know, maybe creating a space where you are trying to understand your parents' uh, view um, and being open to hearing them might make them open to hearing from you. So I would start with cu curiosity and instead of um, judgment. Um, I, I, I totally agree with, uh, uh, with what has been said. Um, I may add, uh, that just be comfortable uh, when, with your parents when you're, you know, they are your parents and your parents love you no matter what. So uh, 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 hoping that the parents will be open-minded and they will be able to realize that, that they are the only one who can help their children. They know their children better than anyone. So have an a, a open, uh, open heart and open mind and talk to your parents about anything that you have, you have doubt about. Nobody will give you a better advice than your parents. So always go first to your parents if you can. So thanks. Thank you. So, so tonight um, we've had a lot of conversation, um, especially you know this panel as well as in the video, talking um, about um, about grief and about the, grieving different things. So, I, the question that I like to ask the panel is, what suggestions would you give to both students and families grieving, not just talking about those who we've lost, but the experiences that we've lost. What would be your suggestions? I, I think that um, we've all gone through kind of a drip, drip, drip of trauma over the last 15 months. Mm -hmm. um, and that we don't even realize how all of these losses have affected us. Um, and that it's really important to normalize it, that, you know, it may not be a death. It may not be you lost, you know, your friend moved to where you can, you know, it's, it's, it's very tiny little things, you know, being able to, to, to go to the store and not have to wear a mask is a big, is, is a loss. Um, and, and to really normalize it. And, you know, what we've really focused on, um, you know, this is mental health awareness month, May. And what we really focused on is that little things matter. And I think all of us here on the panel have really spoken to just the little things in our lives that have mattered, very little things um, uh, that are so individual for every person and to just really focus on that, but, but to not lose sight that it's really normal that we've all had trauma, whether it's large or just like a drip drip every day of being confined. Um, we've all been impacted and it's, it's, we don't even know the impact yet. Um, but we've all been impacted. It's been a really, you know, it's been a really difficult year and a half. So that's really normal. Just really, whatever you're feeling, it's just really normal. Uh, I, I want to add that uh, whatever we've gone through, uh, it's a test for all of us. And how I gone through that by connecting more with my soul and, and realize that I can't control everything. 
okay? And I have to do my best to be a better person, to be a better, to do a better job. But always have the confidence that you can t come over this. It's you who are going to overcome any problem or any situation. Use the help. Use the resources. But it's always you. You are the one who is going to come over any problem facing you. Make sure you reach out to the doctor, you reach out to your neighbor, talk to somebody, but always have the confidence in yourself that you're going to overcome that. Thanks. I think that when we go through, we experience loss, that that is such a perfect um, time to lean on our and look towards our spirituality. I think that anytime we're going through a hardship or we're going through some type of unexpected transition, that it, it, those are the times when we need faith. Those are the times when we're, if we're blindsided or we're feeling less confident or less assured, less clear, that, um, that those are the times when we can rejoice that we have the presence of our higher power to guide us, to help us, to strengthen us. And I think as it relates to our kids, that these are also moments when we can talk about, hey, you know, sometimes we run out of power. Sometimes we run out of hope. Sometimes we run out of strength. Sometimes we run out of direction. But the beauty of spirit, our spirituality, the beauty of our faith, is that when we run out, there is always one that is present um, who's able to fill us again, who's able to redirect us and strengthen us and care for us when we cannot provide self-care for ourselves. So. Reverend Sonia, that was perfect that you talked about self-care because our final question for the evening is that um, we have a question stating that I, I'm overworking myself um, and I, I try not to, but I, I, I still find myself, I can't stop. So what are the suggestions? And I know we've had a lot of rich conversation, but what are some tangible suggestions that this group would give to a participant listening, whether a student or an adult who feels like they're overworking and they just can't stop the overworking? When we initially went into the quarantine, I, uh, we were doing telehealth. I'm a therapist as well, so we were doing telehealth. And I remember the day where I was just felt confused and overwhelmed. I didn't know if I was sleeping at work, working from home. I was, like my worlds had converged. And uh, I remember thinking, and there was one moment where I was getting ready for a session. I had just finished talking to my assistant and we had a meeting with the, the accountant and I'm getting ready to see a client. And then my son is like, what's for lunch? What are we eating? And I'm like, wait a minute, when I'm working, people are not asking me for, to make food. <laughs> and I just felt like I realized I am trying to be superwoman. I'm trying to be the mother, the boss, the therapist, all at the same time. And, um, and it was burning me out. It was just wearing me out. And so I think someone said earlier that we, I had to come to a place where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to, uh, today I am the, the therapist. I am not the therapist and the housekeeper and the mom. Today I am the therapist. And then on this day, I'm going to be the wife and the mom and the homemaker and the house cleaner, <laughs> you know. And so sort of managing my time and creating those moments for self-care. Um, one of the things that I felt like I had lost my home was sanctuary, but now my home has also become my workspace. 
<laughs> and so I have had to be creative about creating spaces in my home. This is the sanctuary or going someplace else and having sanctuary someplace else, but recognizing that I need to have rest and rest is different from sleep. I need to have recreation. I need to have, I need to put the oxygen mask on myself first before I am putting oxygen mask on others. Um, and so I'm, I'm being intentional about making sure I have what I need in order to um, serve others in, in uh, a healthy way. So I think that putting boundaries around your time and uh, specifically identifying times to play certain roles is, is a healthy way to bring balance to your life. I think that's really beautifully said. I, uh, I, I if you can't separate your day of being a, uh, a therapist, your day of being a mom, to your day of being, you know, the accountant, sometimes you just have to be really intentional of making those pauses in your day. I have a big sticky right in front of me, right here. It says, breathe, move, and connect. Yeah. And I really look at that all day long and think, I take my moments to do all three of those things. So it, it is really being very intentional as our as our worlds have collided. Um, and it's it's hard to unmerge them sometimes. Oh, and so I so much want to thank um, all of our panelists, uh, my co-moderator um, for your time with us, you know, and I really want to thank all of our attendees, um, whether you're on Zoom, YouTube, website, wherever you're watching us, um, for attending today's live event. We are so much um, that we have learned um, from the video from our panel um, and having a, a true understanding of around the importance of mental health um, and you know that it's okay at times to not be okay and that there are individuals who are there to help you. Um, and so whether it's talking to your family, your friends, trusted adults at the school, whether it's talking to you know your therapist and getting um, some counseling, um, whether it's talking to a psychiatrist and looking at medication management, there are all sorts of options that are available for you um, to help you um, during these times. So, you know, I really want to thank you um, as we're going through here and um, we're finishing up our event right now. So um, we want to make sure that we showcase some additional resources that are available for families on these topics and additional way making videos um, to watch. And so you can scan the QR code for additional information. And for our students that are watching this event, here is the SSL hour form that students need to complete in order to get their credit for attending and receiving their SSL hours. Students must be logged into their MCPS student accounts to access this Google form. To be eligible for SSL hours, all responses must be submitted by 5 p.m. tomorrow, Thursday, May the 20th. And also, um, we have an evaluation um, for our event. And so you can go um, and click on um, the QR code that's there, and it'll take you to our evaluation for our event. Um, and so in the end, I want to thank Nicole and our expert panelists for your time to be with us today. And we want to thank our viewers for joining us for Waymaking. To send us additional questions and topics to discuss on the show, please visit the links on your screen. Also, please go Go to our YouTube playlist to find additional shows in our Waymaking series. This event's program was live streamed and will be available for playback on YouTube. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our MCPS YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter for more programming updates from MCPS. And please join us next time for MCPS Waymaking.